uh, it's it's no secret that Hasidus has created an amazing revolution, not only in Jewish life, but in the world. The interest that the world is showing, first of all, in Judaism, in Torah, and also in Hasidus, is absolutely amazing. And thanks to the internet, the connection, the conversations, the communication all over the world, every country in the world, people are asking, people want. And the Nevoah, the prophecy, the prediction that we were left with concerning the end of days is that at that time, all the nations of the world will come to the Jewish people and say, show us the way of God. Fifty years ago, that was so hard to believe. All the nations of the world? You mean Russia? China? Saudi Arabia? <laughs> They're going to ask Jews to teach them the way of God? It was only 50 years ago. Today, not only is it not surprising, it's an everyday event. Every day I get Zooms and calls and communications. A week ago, maybe 10 days ago, I got a Zoom call from a native from Tanzania. I said, is that a real country? Is that a made-up name? Tanzania. He barely speaks English. He's a Tanzanian. And he says, you are a light to the nations. So why aren't you here where we need you? Why don't you come to Tanzania? Because we need to learn Torah. He said Torah. It's everywhere. So part of that development was the event of Yutes Kislev. Without this incident, without this historical event, I don't know if the world would be the same today. The Tsar had the Altadeb arrested. What was the accusation? That he's creating a revolution. The Tsars were always paranoid. They were always sure that everybody's plotting against them. And the Altadeb was getting to be known. And so they got paranoid. They were sure that this was a revolution. Part of the uh, accusation was the Altadeba raised a lot of money to send to the Yishuv in Eretz Yisrael. There was a tiny Jewish community in Israel at the time. Israel was under Turkish rule. Russia was at war with Turkey. So when the Rebbe sent money to the Jewish community in Turkey, it was understood to mean that he is that he is uh, supporting the, the Turks against Russia. The other accusation was that he's creating a revolution because he wants to be the king of Israel. And the Rebbe once explained, in every lie, there's a little bit of truth. The Rebbe didn't want to be the king of Israel. He wanted to make God the king of Israel. He was a king maker, not someone trying to be a king. So he was arrested with some very serious uh, threat to his life because counter government activity is punishable by death. He was there for 53 days. 
And the end result was that the Tsar himself was impressed. The ministers were all impressed. And instead of keeping him in prison, he was told that he may legally, officially continue to teach his, his shita, his style of Judaism. And the Rebbe writes in a letter that this was a miracle that the non-Jewish world recognized and appreciated. So the miracle was not just that the Rebbe was released. The miracle was that the holiness of Hasidus, one, was, was victorious against the unholiness of the Tsar. which is something like Yaakov wrestling with the angel. When you read that story, the obvious question is, how do you wrestle with an angel? <laughs> how do you, where do you grab him? <laughs> By his throat? How do you wrestle with an angel? Obviously, it's not physical. The wrestling was the struggle of who is right. Because the angel represented Esav. Esav claimed to be the one that is going to bring Mashiach. Yaakov said, no, you can't bring Mashiach properly, only, only through Torah and mitzvahs. And the question was, who was going to win? It was a, it was a, uh, a battle of ideas, not physical. And the same is true when they released the Rebbe. It wasn't just his personal victory. It was a victory of holiness against unholiness. And this is a big theme in Hasidus and Chabad thinking to this very day. It used to be, without Chabad, without Hasidus, a Jew would think, I really shouldn't sin. I shouldn't eat this non-kosher food. Why? It'll damage me. I'll suffer for it. It will make me uh, insensitive. And I'll, I'll be punished. It was all very personal. Very petty. Just me. I'm the only one who's going to suffer from it. So, looking out for myself, I should be careful not to do this. Hasidus comes and says, it is not a personal struggle. You're not here to be a tzaddik. Every time you're tempted to do something that isn't kosher, it's the, it's the struggle of holy against unholy. So, if the unholiness wins, the whole world goes down a step. If uh, goes up a step. If the unholiness wins, the whole world goes down a step. So it's not personal. And it's not petty. And it's not just me. It's it's the whole picture. So I want to share with you an interesting thought. What Hasidus did for Judaism. Just one little example. You've heard of Adam and Eve? Yeah, you know? Yeah. It was in all the papers. It was a very, very controversial uh, story. The story of Adam and Chava. The first story in the Torah. What is the story? God created Adam and Chava in the Garden of Eden, in Gan Eden. And he said to them, of all the trees you may eat, but of the tree of knowledge, good and evil, do not eat. The day you eat from it, you'll die. This was when Adam and Chava were nine hours old. 
They celebrated every hour. It was a milestone. Hey, it's been nine hours. So it was the ninth hour that God told them not to eat from the tree. Told Adam not to eat from the tree. An hour later, in the tenth hour of the day, they ate from the tree. God comes to Adam and says, you ate from the tree I told you not to eat from? What does Adam say? She made me do it. God asks Chava, what happened? She says, the snake. <laughs> if this is how human beings began, it's not a good story. So then God says, okay, because you did this, you're going to bear children in pain. You're going to have to work very hard to make a living by the sweat of your brow. All sorts of problems, suffering. That's the story. How do you like that? So let me tell you some of the difficulties with this story. Difficulty number one. If God speaks to somebody, does it make an impression or not? If he spoke to Adam up close and personal, one on one, <laughs> Adam couldn't say, are you talking to me? <laughs> Yeah, of course I'm talking to you. There's nobody else. So if he speaks to somebody, shouldn't it make an impression? When he spoke at Har Sinai, everybody died from fear. Fear, And here he's talking to Adam. Makes no impression. An hour later, Adam eats from the tree. And by the way, what was the tree? the most tempting fruit in the world. It was a fig. How tempting is a fig? Next question is, what is it with Adam? He was the smartest man that ever lived. He knew everything. He was absolutely perfect. He had no Yetzirah. He had no evil inclination. And he couldn't last an hour? He should have been at least smart enough to wait till after Shabbos. And then you can say, I forgot. But an hour later, what was he thinking? How was he going to get away with this? Next question. If you eat, when you eat, the day you eat from the tree, you're going to die. Was that really a threat? When you're nine hours old, is death really a, a serious threat? Did he even know what death meant? Nothing ever died. It's a strange story. Then to make matters worse, this perfect human being that God created himself by his own hand, when he's asked, what did you do? He says, she made me. Oh, come on. And then she is not ashamed to say the snake tricked me. <laughs> How embarrassing is that? The snake was the, the most clever animal, but it was an animal. And she's not ashamed to say it tricked me. The final question is, you can't add more punishment after the fact. The warning was, the day you eat from the tree, you'll die. Now God is saying, oh, not, not just die. First, you're going to suffer. <laughs> now the bumper sticker. Life stinks and then you die. <laughs> but that's not kosher. You can't add more punishment after the fact. The biggest question of all, what's the point of the story? What are you telling me? I, I'm starting to study Torah. The first story I come across is that a perfect human being who had no Yetzirah, who was given one commandment, didn't last an hour.
So what chance do I have? Adam didn't have a Yetzirah. He didn't have bad friends. He didn't grow up in a bad neighborhood. He was not traumatized at birth. His mother didn't ruin him at you know toilet training. He didn't have all of these problems. And he had only one mitzvah. Didn't last an hour. Now you're telling me that I should be a good Jew and do what I'm told. I do have a Yetzirah. I do have bad friends. I was traumatized at birth. I live in a bad neighborhood. Everyone around me is not, is not observing or not Jewish. And I have 613 possibilities of blowing it. So good luck. It's such a depressing story. So why tell the story at all? And if you have to tell the story, put it in the Gemara someplace in the back of, of a Gemara that nobody looks at. Why start the Torah with it? So here's what I want to show you. Add a little bit of Hasidus and you come up with a whole different picture. Adam and Chava, before they were created, were two souls in heaven. God came to them and said, I need you to go down to the lowest world and fix it. Elevate it. Refine it. Make it godly. They open their eyes. They're in Gan Eden. And God says to them, of all the trees you may eat, but this tree, Eitz Hadas Teivara, don't eat from it. So they were puzzled. If all the trees are kosher, they don't need to be fixed. The one thing that isn't kosher is the tree, and we're not supposed to eat from it? So what's our job? What is our mission? What are we doing here? We were told to come to the lowest world and fix it. How do you fix it? Adam probably said, let's not eat from the tree, avoid the temptation, resist, and for that we will be rewarded. And Chava very wisely said, we're not here to be rewarded. We're here to fix. If we don't eat from the tree, nothing's going to change. The other trees don't need fixing. What are we doing here? The old question, what is the purpose of life? We were told the purpose is to fix the world. The other mystery was, what does it mean, don't eat from the tree? The day you eat from it, you'll die. That sounds like someday you should eat from it. So maybe today. Sahava said, it is not a mixed message. Don't eat the day you do eat. It's not a mixed message. It's a choice. God is giving us a choice. Don't eat from the tree and live, or eat from it and die. It's your choice. So Adam said, well, then let's not eat from it. Chava said, we're supposed to eat from it. He wants us to eat from it. And Adam asked, how do you know that? How are you so sure? And Chava said, this is all on tape, by the way. This is, you know, reliable, totally. Chava said, we're not in the lowest world. If eating from the tree will make us die, that's the lowest world. That's why we have no job here. In Gan Eden, there's nothing to fix. But not, we're not supposed to be in Gan Eden. We're supposed to be in the lowest world. So he wants us to eat from the tree and go down to the lowest world. 
the world of mortality. So Adam probably said, no, no, no. If he wanted us there, he would have put us there. Since he put us here, it means that this is where we should be. And Chava said, that's not how it works. Freedom of choice means God will take you till the final step, till the threshold, but that last step, we have to volunteer. God took the Yidin out of Mitzrayim, brought them to the border of Eretz Yisrael, and then said, okay, now you decide. You want to go? You don't want to go. That's freedom of choice. Adam realized that that makes a lot of sense, and that if they don't eat from the tree, they're not fulfilling their purpose. So he ate. Now God comes to Adam and says, you ate from the tree I told you not to eat from. You assume he's angry. We always assume God is angry. He's always angry. He speaks in only one voice, loud and angry. No. Not true. God come, came to Adam and said, how did you know? How did you know that you're supposed to eat from it when I told you not to eat from it? So Adam, being a tzaddik and a pure, innocent soul, said, I didn't know. She knew. Isn't that what you meant when you said it's not good for man to be alone? Because <laughs> if it was up to me, I wouldn't have eaten. So God said, that's very good. Then he asked Chava, how did you know? Chava says, I heard what the snake said, and it sounded right. What did the snake say? If you eat from the tree, you will become like God, knowing good and evil. Well, that sounds like our job. So then God says, Perfect. Let me tell you more about the world that you're going into. The world you're going into, there is pain in childbirth. You have to work hard to make bread. It's a rough, it's a rough job. Thank you for volunteering. So actually, there was no sin. There was no violation. There was nothing unholy going on. Because it's Gan Eden and it's God's creation, Adam and Chava, the work of his hands. There was no sin. There couldn't have been. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't learn from that how to handle our Yetzahara in our world where there is sin. We can always learn a lesson. But what actually happened there, there was no sin. So why is it called Chet Eitz Hadas? Because it was a step down. And Chet means a step down. It doesn't mean sin. Aveira is sin. Chet means a step down. Usually, a sin is a step down. Here, there was a giant step down, but there was no sin. So look at how the story has now become the perfect story to begin Torah with. Because you sit down with your child and you say, come, we'll learn Torah. And we'll, we'll learn how to fix the world and make it a better place. The child's first question is going to be, the world is very messed up. How do you know you can fix it? And how did it get so messed up? That's why you have to tell them the story of Adam and Chava. We had a grandmother. Her name was Chava. And she volunteered, knowing how hard the job is going to be, she volunteered to go down to a messed up world 
that they didn't mess up. It's the lowest world. Well, in the lowest world, there's death, there's pain, there's, there's frustration, there's, there's temptation, there's ups and there's down. Did Chava know that it would take 5,782 years to get the job done? She probably did. What's 5,000 years? Before you know it, it's over. <laughs> Actually, Chava was probably the oldest person in history. She lived to be a thousand. A thousand. So to her, five thousand, ah, okay. What's the big deal? So it's a huge compliment to her, and it's a huge compliment to us, that we are still working at this project. We're still trying to fix the world. We got a little discouraged after the Holocaust. Okay, we got very discouraged after the Holocaust. And we thought, no, 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 this is not possible. Such an evil world can't fix it. So one generation went by and we were... We were disheartened, we were discouraged, we were defeated. But as always in history, the generation after that bounced back. Let's make the world a nicer world. Elie Wiesel was determined not to get married and not to have children. Because to bring children into such an evil, dark world is ridiculous. When he came to see the Rebbe, the Rebbe asked him why he's not married. And he told him, and the Rebbe convinced him that that is the wrong response and that he should get married and he did get married and for that he was grateful to the Rebbe for the rest of his life. Why? After a Holocaust, why continue living? Why have optimistic thoughts of a better world? And of course, it's not just the Holocaust. The Holocaust came after 2,000 years of bad news. So if it's that bad, where do you get this crazy notion that you can make the world better? So when the Rebbe became a Rebbe, and he started talking about Conquering the world, fixing the world with Torah. Go out and talk to people and encourage people and go on shlichus, buy a one-way ticket to a town that doesn't want you and see what you can do to make the world better. Who could think like that after a Holocaust? Are you, are you, are you not paying attention? Are you living in denial? Not really. Somebody asked the Rebbe, could a Holocaust happen in America? And the Rebbe said, Morgan and the free. It can happen by tomorrow morning. That's one possibility. The other possibility is we fix the world, make it godly, and there will never be another tear. There will never be another pain. There will never be another sin. So which of the two options do you you prefer. That's an incredible, miraculous, superhuman way of thinking. And it started with Chava. Hasidus adds one more thought. What were Adam and Chava debating? Themselves? There was nothing, there was nothing to talk about whether they were in Gan Eden, outside of Gan Eden, if they ate from the tree or didn't eat from the tree, they would remain the same. They were not threatened at all. The question was, what's going to be with the children? If they don't eat from the tree and stay in Gan Eden, 
the children will all be tzaddikim. If they eat from the tree, they will still be fine because their intentions were holy and good, but they knew that the children, not so good. And the children are going to have to do tshuva. So Adam said, let's not eat. We'll have children who are tzaddikim. What could be better? So Chava said, the Baal tshuva is greater than the tzaddik. And when she explained that to him, he admitted that she was right and he ate from the tree. So God now comes to Adam and says, you ate from the tree I told you not to eat from? How did you know? How did you know that a bel tshuva is greater than a tzaddik? It's in the Gemara, but the Gemara hasn't been written yet. To this, Adam said, I didn't know. She knew. How did she know? So Adam names her right after that event. Adam names her Chava, which means the mother of all life. The way we thought the story, the conventional understanding, is she, Chava, is the mother of all death. She brought death to the world. But she didn't. In the lowest world, there is death. Nobody has to bring it. What she did was, she chose the path for her children. She wanted them to be Bali Chuva rather than Sadiqim. And she was right. Why was she right? Because when it comes to the children, you always trust the mother. So that's what Adam said. She knew. And I trusted her because she's the mother. So here we are in a generation that is all tshuva. Even religious people, so-called, need to do tshuva. Tshuva means I haven't even begun to serve God yet. That's the difference between a tzaddik and a bal tshuva. A tzaddik says, I did very well today. Tomorrow, I'm going to do better. It builds, accumulates. The bal tshuva feels, I haven't even started yet. What did I do yesterday? That was yesterday. Today, I'm going to become God's servant. Now I'm going to begin to serve. It's a new enthusiasm. It's fresh. It's beginning. There's all sorts of possibilities when you first start. It's a different energy than the tzaddik. And it gets you closer to fulfilling the purpose for which God created us. That is Hasidus. That's what the Alta Rebbe began 250 years ago, approximately. And it changed the world, but people did not appreciate it back then. Now we're starting to appreciate what kind of, what kind of revolution the thinking in Tanya and in Hasidus brings. So the fact that we're sitting here tonight is because the Alte Rebbe got out of prison and was told that he may continue to teach Hasidus. And here we are, whether you're from Russia or not. This is the new world. Everybody now understands that tshuva is greater than the tzaddik. Everybody. Fifty years ago, when the Rebbe first began, people were saying, what are you talking about? What's about tshuva? Who's going to do tshuva? Got to be a tzaddik. Got to be a Talmud Chacham. Now, nobody, nobody doubts. Nobody has any questions. 
Of course you have to do tshuva. It's the only way. Because that's how you fix the world. It doesn't mean you have to sin, by the way. You don't have to, like the guy says, what is the first step in tshuva? The sin. <laughs> first you have to sin. No, you don't have to sin to do tshuva. You have to feel, I haven't even begun yet. A tzaddik can feel that too. Final thought. One of the tests for Avraham, God comes to Avraham when he's 99 years old and he says, have a bris. Have a bris. Avraham already is serving God with Mesiras Nefesh all his life from the age of three. And God comes to him and says, uh, I don't think you've had a bris yet. In other words, you haven't even started being a Jew yet. You're a baby. And you need a bliss. That was the test. Avram could have been very offended. Excuse me. Everything I did until now is nothing? You're asking me to start now? That was the Baal in Avraham Avinu. He understood. You can risk your life, devote your life, have Maseras Nefesh. And then the next morning you wake up and you say, you know, I should start serving God. Because what was, was. Now I'm starting. Every day the same feeling. So don't be a tzaddik. Don't try to be a tzaddik. Just wake up in the morning and say, what can I do for you? Today I'm ready to start. That is magnificent. That's what we're celebrating. L'chaim. If you enjoyed this conversation or this topic, and you're looking for more information, or you want to hear it again from another angle, there is a way to do that. And that is in this book. It's all there. Order it from Amazon. You can read it, reread it, and share it. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal. It's questions and answers. It's conversation. It's really relaxed. It's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program. There's a... Um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us, take a look, click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best and join us for some enjoyable conversation.